Bonjour à tous. Um, hi to all. Uh, my name is Elisabeth Vallet. I am the director of the Center for Geopolitics at the Raoul Dantirantia at the University of Quebec at Montreal. We are here together uh, for this uh, roundtable with um, um, great scholars on, on border studies. And uh, we will be, um, uh, the, 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 the meeting will be hosted by uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Payen, who is uh, the French Françoise and Edward Durgin, fellow from Mexico Studies and the director for the Center for the United States and Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Uh, Dr. Payan is also a professor of social science at the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez in Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, Mexico, um, and as well as a, um, a renowned uh, border scholar himself. Um, just a quick word on the project that brought us here. We have decided decided to discuss the, the states of, of borders and, and border fencing and border fortifications around the world. And it seemed uh, fairly relevant uh, in, uh, in a pending, pandemic time when uh, borders are closing very fast. And um, this uh, is aiming at being published in a, a special issue of um, geopolitics. So I just wanted to uh, mention uh, that. And uh, Tony Payan uh, will uh, now chair the panel. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm very honored and pleased to, uh, to, uh, to have been invited to preside over this interesting conversation. Uh, je vous remercie de m'avoir invité uh, pour uh, cet événement aussi important sur les murs uh, frontalières. Uh, and uh, for the benefit of our, uh, of our audience, uh, I will uh, explain the uh, dynamics of the panel. This is a conversation. It's not really uh, a presentation. Uh, as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, uh, the conversation is on border walls and their significance in the world today, the 21st century. As we know, uh, they, uh, they are popping up everywhere. Uh, and uh, we want to have a solid conversation, which will eventually lead into a, a uh, special issue uh, of geopolitics on this issue. So today we're going to hear some interesting insights on the research that each of our guests are conducting regarding border, border walls around the world. Um, <clears throat> I will first uh, uh, introduce our panel, uh, and then uh, I'll ask a question of each of them, and they can... Uh, 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 present their uh, uh, the preliminary research uh, findings, and then we'll have a, a broader uh, question conversation, and then we'll go to Q and A from from the public. And so, thank you again uh, for that. Um, in the in the panel today, we have uh, first early in the morning of the following day, uh, Mirza uh, Zulfikur Rahman. Uh, from uh, India. He's a uh, visiting research associate at the Institute of Chinese Studies in Delhi, India. Welcome, Mirza. Um, we also have Irene Cabrera Nosa, who is a researcher uh, in, at the Universidad Externado de Colombia, as well as a professor uh, and researcher at the Observatory for International Migration. Um, uh, where she is a full-time professor. Welcome, Irene, uh, to the panel. Thank we you. have uh, Damiano Canale, who is a professor of law at the Università Bocconi uh, in Italy. Welcome, Damiano. Thank you for joining us. And we have uh, Brigitte Picard, who is a reader in Humanitarianism in Conflict, an interesting title, at uh, Oxford Brookes University and uh, at this moment in Paris or the area surrounding Paris, France. Thank you, Brigitte, for uh, being here. And of course, we have Kenneth Madsen, uh, whose work I know well, uh, who is at Ohio State University uh, right now, even though his background is a uh, border fence in my hometown, Juarez El Paso, uh, right on the US-Mexico border. And of course, we have uh, our host and uh, coordinator of the project, Elizabeth Vallée, who is an associate professor of international studies at the Royal Military College Saint-Jean in uh, Quebec. Welcome everyone uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to a very interesting conversation. So let's uh, <clears throat> let's begin with a little bit of the um, of your research uh, and I'll put a question on the table and then allow you a few minutes to react and present your your understanding of the um, of the issue uh, from your own perspectives. 
Uh, I'll start with uh, our coordinator, uh, Elizabeth uh, Vallet. Elizabeth, your research uh, deals with the expansion of border walls around the world. We know that there's probably over 70 now, and uh, uh, now ranging in the hundreds, if not thousands of miles of walls around the world now. Uh, this is a global phenomenon, not just on our well-known border, the US-Mexico border, but everywhere. They're popping up everywhere uh, between uh, uh, nation states for different reasons as well. In your perspective is the geopolitical perspective on border walls. So relating the issue or the, the topic that brings us together, border walls is, the, is a physical barrier uh, that now uh, uh, essentially divides uh, uh, nations and peoples uh, with the concept of sovereignty, state borders, and mobility. Uh, uh, that is border cross-border flows, particularly individuals. Uh, can you uh, can you tell us um, uh, in some ways how walls are affecting uh, these uh, three concepts: sovereignty, state borders, and especially mobility across borders from a geopolitical perspective? Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Tony. Um, it's interesting. The uh, Dominican Republic just launched uh, the construction of a 380 kilometer long fence along its border with Haiti. So it is definitely we've been hearing about that project, but it's getting more concrete, so to speak. So uh, it is definitely a, a common and current phenomenon. Um, it's interesting to see that you are right. Um, there are more than 72 um, border fences and border walls uh, in the world. Uh, one thing that needs to be mentioned beforehand is um, the very idea of the wall. Um, Hank von Hutem um, has uh, written recently that he sees the, the mention of the border wall as a shortcut and that um, the infrastructure per se um, is uh, sometimes it's, it's mis it, it, it is according to him misleading that we are using even the word and and maybe even um, emboldening governments um, and and uh, pushing further the very idea of uh, the the wall as being a solution. So even speaking about it and not renaming it could be actually a mistake. And I think it is interesting as long as we, uh, as long as we consider the border wall like um, the 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 sole fence. But if we see the border wall as a concept that includes uh, uh, the the impact on the borderlands, that includes the all the things that go around the very fence, uh, visas, uh, surveillance, sensors. Um, uh, Kenneth and I have been uh, doing some uh, um, groundwork at the, uh, at, at the at the border, at the very borderways, and uh, and and you see, you have to see the ex the 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 extent of the of the surveillance apparatus around the border to understand that uh, the border wall needs to be thought and, and and in terms of a wider thing than just a mere fence um so i think this is the uh, the, the the preamble that was uh, necessary um the growing pace of border fortification does signal the 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 will uh, or the um the the, the ease with which governments will go towards that solution because it's a ready-made solution an easy solution it shows that uh population that their public opinion that they are doing something so it is really a a theater and many like terence garrett have been talking about the the spectacle of the um of the border but what needs to be uh, seen and i think in terms you, you were asking about the border and 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 states and sovereignty is the ripple effect of the border wall and the fact that where you build a border wall um is not the only space that will be impacted by the border wall but it, the, the the impact will go way beyond uh, the sole uh, border and the sole borderland um so in terms of uh, of sovereignty, the border wall is only signaling is is it is not reinforcing sovereignty, although it is what it is uh, said to be doing, but it is actually just uh, reinforcing a, an internal a domestical domestic uh, political discourse, but definitely not. Um, 
the sovereignty of the, the border. And what border walls do achieve, in fact, is, and we have to see them as an experiment. They are, um, they are altering, modifying the space of the borderlands. And, and we, know, we do know that borderlands are in a way kind of being peripheral, are seen almost as laboratories uh, where ex experiments are being conducted. And I think we have to see the border wall as one of them. And as an experiment, it does have other impacts that we need to, um, to assess uh, precisely. Uh, so I, I think that it, it's if we see that as in an experiment, that it, it's not something that is either altering the state, but it is altering the way the state functions, um, beginning on the peripheries. And by and by, the ripple effect of the wall is having an effect on the state itself, even at its core. I, um, I want to add a very briefly a follow-up question, Elizabeth, because you mentioned something about sovereignty and whether walls actually reaffirm the concept of sovereignty, reinforce it, or actually are just part of a political spectacle, political theory on the border. But uh, do they add to governance? Do you think that they actually add to order and governance or good governance at border regions? It's... Um it's the entropy of order. So the uh, the uh, <laughs> they they are designed or meant to 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 um, foster governance and a better governance. But I think that in fact one of the first effects of the wall is to destructure the 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 function the main functions of a borderland, which is kind of a mangrove. A borderland tends to absorb the, the shocks coming from the outside. But with why we are building those uh, membranes that are meant to be uh, impermeable, we tend to destructure that function. So I, I, I would say that actually it leads to less governance and the evaporation of flows, that, that is something, one of the effects of the wall, um, leads to those flows going elsewhere and having other impacts, hence destructuring further the governance of other, uh, other spaces along the line. So I would say that definitely not, uh, it's not adding to a better governance, it's an illusion. Very interesting, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I wanna uh, go next to, to Damiano Canale and I wanna ask him to add to this conversation from his own perspective, you're a professor of law uh, and obviously walls affect relations between countries and, uh, and they have legal implications for nations and, uh, and their binational relationships. Can you tell us how walls are affecting legal interaction between states in regard to their sovereignty and their capacity to uh, really govern cross-border flows uh, as well as, um, as um, uh, I guess, uh, how they affect the concept of sovereignty itself? Yes, uh, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Elizabeth, for the invitation. So <clears throat> I have to say that border walls are a very fascinating and challenging topic from the legal point of view. Uh, they are obviously so if we wonder whether border walls are a legitimate tool for the governance of populations according to national, international, or humanitarian law. But border walls are also interesting if we look at them uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, from the point of view of philosophy of law, for instance. I'm a legal philosopher, therefore I'm very much interested in, in, in this aspect of border walls. So uh, one striking aspect of border walls is related to their physical consistency and shape. You mentioned these aspects uh, before. This is something very uh, peculiar to border walls. So it's obvious that these kind of borders uh, carry out their function only in so far as they have the shape of physical uncrossable barriers, regardless of whether they are built close to the state border, inside the territory of a state or at the edge of the territory of several states. Uh, this seems to highlight a breakaway 
uh, from the traditional conception of state borders in, in modern law, in our standard understanding of international law and the law of borders. Uh, on this conception, state borders are imaginary, immaterial lines uh, that uh, mark off the spatial extensions of state sovereignty powers. In this sense, they carry out their institutional function uh, independent of their material shape and consistency. Uh, what were the traditional functions of state borders? This is a long story, but to make this long story short, uh, from the legal point of view, borders, we could say, uh, neutralize personal differences, both inside and outside the territory of the state. Uh, within state territory, all individuals are formally equal uh, in the sense that they are equally subject to the law of the state. This is the, 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 the key point of the idea of sovereignty at the very end. Any personal differences based on ethnic or religious, linguistic or cultural um, uh, features is made irrelevant with regard to the validity and the authority of law. Uh, the same holds true if we look at the external space. So what's uh, like outside borders, anything outside state border is simply a state among other states whose action is regulated by international law. And this is the reason why state borders are traditionally seen, as Elizabeth uh, mentioned before, as uh, as place of transit, we could say, uh, not as an uncrossable barrier. They regulate and guarantee the transit of persons and goods from one state to another according to mutual agreements among states. Uh, the thing is that uh, border walls had quite different characteristics. They seem to carry out totally different purposes and functions. They do not uh, neutralize uh, personal differences within the territory of the state and outside the territory of the state, or try to neutralize these differences place. On the one hand, we could say they are used to govern populations on the basis of their ethnical, social, and cultural features, such as in the case of migration control. On the other hand, they are often not regulated by state law or international law. Border walls are usually built by government agencies to pursue security goals and cannot be submitted to deep judicial scrutiny. They are tools for government that are not strictly subjected to state law and constitutional scrutiny in particular. In this sense, border was seems to be, in many cases at least, uh, a brand new institutional entity, something totally new uh, that requires uh, a revision, a strong revision of our standard uh, legal categories of understanding. Uh, and in my research, I try to focus on the different kinds of border walls that are rising up around the world and on um, their functional characteristics. I think that this may be of help for a better understanding and evaluation of this phenomenon. I, uh, I want to follow up with a, a question for you, Damiano, and uh, based on, on your conversation. Our, our experience with the uh, border wall between Mexico and the United States is that they don't necessarily stop any flows, anyone. They don't necessarily protect the sovereignty of the state, but rather they distort uh, human flows, for example, other products, drugs, and things like that. There's drones, there's tunnels, there's submersibles, there's people will always go around these walls. Uh, uh, and, uh, and they also seem, they appear, I think it's something to be researched, but they also appear to strengthen organized crime because organized crime seems to guarantee 
uh, crossing the, the, the border despite the wall, but at a higher premium. So how do you see legally, from a legal perspective, that walls actually distort the implementation of law in, in uh, international law and the binational relations uh, between two countries that uh, usually one decides to erect a wall? How do you, how do you view that interaction there? Yes, that, that's a good question, actually. So uh, on the legal side, so to say, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, World of War seems to escape the standard uh, way of regulating the flow of people around the world. So uh, they are not democratically legitimate in a sense. Normally, they are conceived as governmental tools uh, that are acceptable as long as they are efficient tool to achieve a certain end. And that's it. Uh, on the other hand, the rights that are uh, affected by the rising up of border walls seems not being protected using the standard tools that we have in constitutional law. Because of the way in which these kind of entities are considered uh, within the legal system. So th th there are Paradoxical effect of all this is that we have this kind of new environment, these new uh, um, tools for the government of population, which on the one hand escape the law, as the law as we were used to thinking about law, and on the other hand uh, are not able to achieve the end they are supposed to achieve. Exactly for the reason that you mentioned. So there are not efficient, an efficient uh, measure to fight against crime, uh, to, to stop the flow of people from one state to another, and so on. And it seems to me that they are uh, imaginary. So their uh, symbolic power is the most important thing uh, for the government. They have a symbolic power in the sense that they show up the fact that the government is taking care of a certain problem, independent of this is the right thing to do. And on the other hand, they cover the, uh, what is going on, actually going on. So the fact that they are not affected, a suitable way to uh, address the problem that they are supposed to solve. So it's a really paradoxical entity, in my view. <laughs> Thank you, Damiano. Uh, I want to go next uh, uh, to continue our conversation to Irene Cabrera Nosa. Uh, Irene, uh, people live in the shadow of the wall. I mean, there are 15 million people that live on the US Mexico border, 7.5 million on the US side, and 7.5 million on the Mexican side. We also know that Palestinians, as well as Israelis, uh, live on the shadow of the wall. And there are many, many other places where people have to live with the wall, the consequences. So from your research, particularly in bordering uh, in Europe, uh, how are uh, different actors uh, reacting, adjusting, adapting uh, to the wall? How, do you, how would you highlight the effect that the walls have on the populations that live, so to speak, in the shadow of the, uh, of the walls. How are uh, they affected by the wall? And a, a kind of a challenging question, how do they affect the wall? How do they interact with the wall itself? Uh, so uh, talk to us about this interaction of populations affected by and interacting with the walls. Irene, thank you. Thank you, Tony, for your question and this kind invitation. Well, um, 
first of all, I think it's important to consider that uh, regarding walls, not only states have a role in creating this um, devices of uh, control, right? Because uh, we have multiple levels of government, but also, as you mentioned, non-state actors like border communities, NGOs, and uh, uh, even private enterprises with stakes in the existence and transformation of these border barriers. It means that we cannot think that uh, the permanence and the uh, existence of the world is just uh, a decision uh, or a result or, or an output of the state, but we have um, relationship and a lot of pressure from different kind of actors. So in, in this sense, uh, we have done some research on uh, these logics and interests uh, that uh, are related to other actors in regard to uh, border fences uh, in Europe. And that is something interesting because we are trying to um, have a more comprehensive view on the idea of this uh, influence of contradictory visions, interests, and exp expectations among key uh, multiscolor actors on these walls and if this has any consequence in the continuity or in the transformation of such physical borders. So we, we started with this idea of dissonance uh, in terms of contradictory visions, uh, interests and expectations regarding the existence, the administration, the features of, and, the, and the goals of border barriers. And we found that, uh, for example, at the European Union level, um, there is a shared uh, idea that it is important to reduce immigration flows uh, towards Europe. Notwithstanding, um, at the same time, we have uh, local uh, groups uh, in terms of civil society organizations at the local and international level uh, stating that it's important to rethink if these walls are the best strategy to fulfill this goal of reducing immigration flows. And um, while we, we found that in the recent five years, there is an strengthening and uh, I don't know, like an extension of these fences uh, around Europe. On the other hand, as you mentioned before, there are alternatives uh, to to guarantee that uh, these migrants will cross these uh, international borders. So something that is, is very important here is that um, the, the criticisms from these actors are related not only with the suitability of the fence as the best tool to uh, reduce um, these uh, immigration flows, but also there are specific demands in terms of the features of the wall, for example, the use of rust or wires in, in the top or the uh, strategies in terms of uh, creating some um, operation and police operations against the campaments of uh, refugees and migrants around the world, that, that is uh, very problematic because it also creates uh, social fragmentation. Um, it has some consequences that have been pointed out by different organizations in terms of this um, idea that all migrants and refugees are uh, a danger or are uh, uh, creating risks for uh, the society on, at one level, but uh, on the other level, there, there is this idea that uh, everything is uh, valid against uh, this uh, immigration that is not um, uh, decided by this state that is building the, the wall. So uh, from the local actors perspective, it's, it's important to uh, consider from a human security perspective, all the effects 
or counterproductive effects of these uh, border fences, because we are uh, talking here about, uh, for example, the this rise on uh, human uh, trafficking, uh, the smuggling of migrants, but also all these um, security problems uh, that are related to the uh, creation of, of these uh, fences. Let's take an example. Uh, just the last year, uh, the Greek government decided to create a flotating fence between uh, Turkey and Greece as a way to reduce all these crossings through the Mediterranean Sea. And um, what we can see here is that there are uh, a lot of incentives now to go further and to create other routes. And this is boosting uh, transnational organized crime in a, in a way that uh, we see that this idea of creating fences is also counterproductive for the local security uh, context because we 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 found we find that um, in in these uh, cases of uh, Europe fences uh, there is a degradation in in the security perception of. Uh, border communities, because uh, instead of creating cooperative and some dialogue processes among the states, these barriers are creating uh, some kind of um, misunderstandings uh, among uh, local governments, national governments, and the uh, local population is just like uh, in the middle of, of, of these kind of, of processes. And uh, we, we have as a challenge here uh, the need to uh, change this huge or, or common paradigm of uh, creative, uh, creating a punitive uh, approach regarding uh, the um, the management or, or the governance of, of migration. That I think it is something central to to this debate, because of course in the in the field of, of border studies uh, we are giving. Um, this idea that the only option to solve uh, security problems in these areas is by is, is to create a, a wall or a fence. Uh, but uh, on the other side, uh, we have local actors, non-state actors, uh, looking for alternatives that involve the, part, uh, the, part, the participation of border communities, cooperation, prevention, in terms of what is needed to uh, Mm, improvise or help local uh, conditions of these migrants in the uh, outside, for example, Europe in the Middle East, but also to create uh, some protocols to um, have some uh, order in the movement of these uh, persons without putting them at risk, as it is uh, evident in some statistics of the uh, International uh, Migration Organization that is uh, following is doing a follow up about the number of uh, disappearances and and persons that are are dying in these uh, very risky uh, points of of crossing uh, throughout Europe. So I think um, in, in general terms, these non-state actors are giving us a lot of arguments and evidences about the, the uh, incapability of the governments to really accomplish their goals through these fences and the counterproductive consequences that uh, some local populations are facing because they're there is uh, this securitization of, of migration that is not well handed and we need to rethink how to address these kind of challenges. Let me add to, to, to that uh, kind of a follow-up question because you're, you're talking about the interaction between local actors and, and the wall and the way they view the wall and so on. But let me, uh, and obviously I think we all agree that walls are a blunt instrument and a, a, a physical objective attempt of the state to control uh, the the um, not just the territory but also the discourse, because as Elizabeth mentioned earlier, there is a whole political theory, a whole political scaffolding um, uh, that, that uh, spectacle that is built around the walls. And it's uh, it's interesting because you build a wall, you build a spectacle, and that means that many of these actors actually support uh, the wall. So not everybody is against walls. If you go to Israel, for example, most Israelis support the building of the wall between Israel and the Palestinian territories. And if you go to the U.S.-Mexico border, 
among Republicans, at least, there is quite a bit of support for building the wall. So not everybody interacts the same way with the wall. Not everybody perceives the wall to be unnecessary, to be uh, use, useless, uh, and, um, and, and so on. How do you, how do you deal with, with the, 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 uh, not just the building of the wall, but the building of the discourse that actually supports the building of, of the wall? How do you see your, and, and the European publics too, have a, often a mixed reaction to walls. Some of them actually support it. Exactly. In, in fact, we we kind of uh, created a, a methodology to do a follow up of what we call this dissonance uh, among key actors regarding these walls. And we were studying the fences of uh, Melilla, the fence between Greece and Turkey, the, the fence between Hungary and Serbia, and the uh, fence of Calais in France. And we found that um, the same actor, for example, the European Union, may show more, uh, um, let's say, uh, some uh, disagreements regarding the, the suitability of the, these borders to uh, restrain migration. And it is, it is uh, very uh, paradigmatic because on the one hand, uh, we have uh, the European Home Affairs Commissioner decline, de declining the, the Greek request for funding the defense in 2015, but more recently, um, the European Union now promised to help uh, with the presence of Frontex in uh, the last year, and at the same time uh, is uh, giving some money to uh, reinforce the defense of Malaysia. But uh, in the cases of Hungary and uh, Greece, uh, the European Union does not promote the use of fences um, in a public, in different public statements. So we we have tried to create not only. Um, a follow up of uh, how specific actors have different views, but also one actors like one a specific actor like uh, the European Union is having different positions regarding these these walls. So there are some mixed uh, statements that we need to to um, consider here. Um, but in, in general terms, when we are thinking about uh, this uh, dissonance, um, I think it's it's interesting uh, to see that of course there are some local governments just uh, beside the wall that are supporting the, the policy of creating walls, uh, like it is the case of the local government of Melilla or the local government of uh, Oristiada and the local government of uh, Calais. Um, but at the same time, um, we have uh, that organizations like Amnesty International are creating uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, quite a, a commitment in terms of in spite of any type of wall and whatever is uh, the the agenda behind the wall, we need to rethink these devices as a mechanism of control. So it's, it's, it's interesting because we are trying to measure these levels of dissonance, uh, contrasting um, if they agree on the final goal or the final purpose of the of the wall if they agree in the features of, of the wall and they agree in the consequences that the each fence is, is bringing about it and we found that there are higher levels of, of dissonance for example in the uh, fences uh, between turkey and greece and the uh, fence between Hungary and Serbia in, comp in comparison to what is going on with uh, the defense in Malaysia and the defense of Calais. So it's, it's something that we need to uh, think uh, very in detail, in, in a detailed way, uh, because of course, uh, it is changing depending on who is in power, for example, at the local level, or how Brexit uh, may change also the relationship between France and um, the UK regarding uh, this area of, of Calais. So uh, it's, it's something that I think it's a uh, a, a big uh, a space or a topic that we need to uh, go uh, in, a, in a deeper way to understand the, the implications of having different actors with different views uh, regarding these, these walls and to what extent they are able to have some influence in the transformation of the wall and 
to this point, all these fences are becoming uh, more e extensive or have been strengthened. So um, I think we need to to see if there is some incidence or um, a, a change in, in the wall uh, through the participation and active criticism of these other actors. All right. Very, very interesting, Irene. Let me go to Kenneth uh, uh, Madsen. Um, uh, uh, Kenneth, uh, we know. Uh, in the wall that uh, is now your background right there on your, on your picture. We know that the U.S. government has waived itself the implementation of a number of laws that have to do with the environmental impact, security impact, and so on. They don't, the government does not hesitate in essentially canceling and annul, annulling its own laws and regulations to build these walls. There is obviously an internal contradiction. Uh, so, and, you, and you're doing a lot of work on mapping uh, these legal waivers. What can we draw from this use of uh, discretionary power to go over and above and beyond the laws to build a walls? How do you examine that rather strange practice of uh, creating a state of exception uh, up against many laws to build uh, a wall like this. Yeah, there's quite an irony um, in this whole concept in that um, one of the primary rationales given for building border walls is to enforce the rule of law, right? We must, if we have immigration laws, we must enforce them. Uh, if we have drug smuggling laws, we must enforce them. Uh, and the way one of the pri one of the primary ways that that's done in the U.S. southern border context uh, is, in fact, to ignore a whole bunch of laws relating to uh, protection of the environment, uh, relating to the protection of historical sites and artifacts, uh, and even um, in the last couple of years, even the waiving of procurement regulations. So those, those rules, those laws that oversaw the development and signature of contracts um, so that there's proper oversight, so the money is properly spent so that you don't get a contractor who's going to um, do a shoddy job, for example. Um, and so those are all waived. So in order to enforce the law, then we have waived the laws. Uh, and this dates back to the Real ID Act of 2005, uh, when as part of a spending bill, uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security was given the authority to waive any laws they deemed necessary for expeditious construction of, of border walls and fences. Um, so the power resides solely within uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, they can't waive constitutional protections, but they can waive anything that has been passed subsequently by, by Congress. Uh, and in my research, what I've been looking at uh, are that there's been 32 instances uh, of waiver proclamations when the secretary has published in the Federal Register, which is the official record of doing government business with the U.S. federal government. A proclamation stating which laws are to be waived in which locations. Um, and so there's been 32 of these instances and over time they've waived 84 various laws and statutes. Um, the, they, only, they tend to waive them only for particular areas where they expect to be construction, there to be construction. Um, so it's interesting. Sometimes you can anticipate where construction or contracts might be signed uh, by looking at where these waivers uh, are, are being being put in place. Uh, and there was even one signed. One was published as late as January. I think it was January fourth uh, in the in the very last days of the Trump administration. In or and and they were largely to do with uh, procurement regulations. That so they could lock in place uh, a series of contracts that then. Um, uh, the Biden administration might have difficulty backing out of uh, here. Um, and you, I, I, I want to tie this into the question you asked Elizabeth earlier about does it add to border, to, to govern, to good governance, I think 
uh, what was part of that question. Um, because it, it tends to eliminate oversight is, is essentially what this waiving process has done. One of the key laws has been the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, uh, which requires for these large government projects that uh, the government consider their options so that they, they look at the impacts uh, of these large construction projects. Uh, what are the impacts environmentally, culturally, historically? Uh, and then what are the options? Um, it doesn't actually mandate that the government select the least invasive option but it does mandate an awareness that, the, that people know which options they could have gone with uh, and which ones um, were, were more damaging. Um, so it's rather extensive. It, it covers uh, a pretty wide swath. I don't have a final number. I'm still actually mapping a few of these. Uh, it's been a long, uh, difficult process. Um, but it covers most areas, almost all areas where there's been a population centers. Um, it it tend the, the biggest gap where there's not a lot of waivers is in West Texas, uh, kind of in the Big Bend area. Uh, almost everywhere else uh, is covered by one or more waivers. Uh, and the theoretically they apply in perpetuity, so they don't expire. Um, so that in the future, and, and there's no depth to them either. Uh, so it hasn't been upheld in a court of law or anything, but uh, like how far away do these, are these laws waived? Five miles, 10 kilometers, two feet? Uh, it, it's, it's not clear. Um, so the, these waivers have been rather extensive. There were five of them under the Bush administration, 27 under the Trump administration. Um, none were issued under the Obama administration, although uh, there was construction carried out under the Obama administration that had been mandated uh, by Congress uh, under President Bush. Uh, and that's the question we're waiting for right now, uh, really, is there's a 60-day moratorium uh, that's been declared by presidential proclamation uh, to review the contracts. And I think part of what they're looking at is, uh, is there a way out of those contracts uh, legally? Um, can, can they be undone? To what extent? Uh, what penalties might there be? Um, it doesn't, it would, it, would be inter it would be an interesting application of the waivers uh, if, they, if they waive more laws to get out of contracts like that. Uh, but I'm not sure that that, that would be a proper use uh, of them. I want to follow up with a quick question on that because uh, as a, um, I'm not a legal scholar, but I'm a political scientist and, uh, and uh, I have uh, done extensive studies on political philosophy, and I'm concerned uh, about the fact that it appears to me that this issue of the border walls and the waivers are undermining our very concept of the rule of law. Uh, for example, in your comment, you mentioned uh, contracts may not, perhaps may not be canceled or annulled, they're sacred, uh, but environmental laws are not sacred. So contracts are more sacred than environmental laws. Contracts may not be perhaps canceled, but environmental laws may be. And in Texas, as you know, I, I live on the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, uh, property is sacred until it's not uh, and can be confiscated, can be expropriated at de facto or the jure for uh, these purposes. So the very idea of walls is making us, is distorting our uh, rule of law in many, many different ways. And now we're picking and, and choosing what laws, what contracts, and what rights apply and where and when they do not apply. So what is this doing to our concept of we are a country of laws? I think you're right. It, it erodes away at that concept. Uh, it undermines the idea uh, that there were protections in place to make sure uh, we don't go overboard uh, in accomplishing a project, uh, in this case, building border walls. Um, I mean, there are other kinds of waivers. This is not something I've looked at a lot, but um, for example, uh, after hurricane damage in Puerto Rico, uh, there were some laws waived that allowed non-US ships uh, to dock to bring supplies in Puerto Rico. 
So if you look through the Federal Register, there are all kinds of waivers, but this, uh, by many accounts, is one of the more extensive and systematic and, and under, uh, under, what's the word I'm looking for, um, uh, has no limits uh, in terms of, of how it can, can be applied. You mentioned the case of, of, of land ownership in Texas. Uh, and in the earlier iteration, pre-Trump construction of border walls, um, that was that border, not as many were built in Texas. And that largely has to do with a lot of the land right on the border is in private hands, or as in the other three border state, it's public land. And so it's easier to get a hold of. Uh, the eminent domain protections uh, are, are what keep the government from just saying it's mine, right? They have to go through some kind of court process. They have to document um, uh, how, they, how they would get that. And that actually is a constitutional protection. Um, it's, so they can't waive that entirely. Uh, it can be ramrodded through, it can be pushed through, and, and it is. Uh, and in fact, uh, they don't even have to go through all the court proceedings to start using the land. Uh, it can drag on for years, even as the government moves forward uh, with that. Um, but the specific ways in which it's implemented can be waived. And a lot of these waivers are, are somewhat, uh, I should add, they're, they're somewhat preemptive. They're, they're designed not to get the government tied up in a court of law defending its actions. Um, so sometimes it's not always clear why a law was waived. They just don't want to be taken to court uh, to document that, that they're, they're not um, uh, doing something. Uh, and so uh, it, it keeps them out of the courts in that sense. Thank you, Kenneth. Let me uh, go to our next two, two panelists. I'm gonna go to uh, Mirza uh, first. Um, uh, uh, Mirza, uh, there are uh, some border walls going up in Asia as well. You're in the middle of Asia. Uh, you're in India and Delhi right now. Uh, there's a lot of infra infrastructure that is interacting in some, sometimes kind of perverse ways with uh, uh, rivers, mountains, the environment, and uh, so on. There's also, of course, specifically between China and India uh, and uh, the impact on these walls. How is that playing out in Asia uh, where the extensions are enormous? We're talking about thousands of miles that may affect very deeply everything from rivers, enormous rivers, to mountains, to mountain ranges, um, uh, to, to canyons, and, uh, and rather, a, a rather difficult uh, 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 difficult terrain. Um, how is that playing out uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, border wall building uh, that has been going on in Asia? Thank you, uh, thank you, Tony, uh, for um, moderating the discussion, and also in, uh, thank you, Andrian and Elizabeth, to uh, for inviting me for this uh, to be part of this conversation. I think it is a very important conversation in the sense that it is also bringing in so many different kind of. Um, this cross-cultural understandings of how we are grappling with border walls and and the whole understanding of border walls as pointed out by Elizabeth earlier is that it is something that is meant to be um, spectacular uh, and is a site of control. Uh, a controlling of what? A controlling of flows, uh, human flows. Um, and in this case, in where I am doing my research, which is in the northeast of India, and I am based in Guwahati now, not in Delhi, uh, where actually we look at the India-China border, the large expanse of the India-China border, and uh, we see that this, there is not a single fence because it is not demarcated. Uh, it is still known by different ways, like, like the McMahon line and the line of actual control. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, when we look at this larger space between India and China, there is not a single border wall, but there is so much of power play that is happening in this geography. Uh, um, in a sense that the Himalayas, the Himalayas that encompass this borderland region uh, is uh, actually home to a lot of um, uh, very, very uh, minority ethnic communities. Uh, uh, starting from Tibet uh, to uh, Nepal to Bhutan to India to uh, to the Eastern Himalayas, all across, uh, and 
and this is something that is is a very very you know uh, kind of a important bio region in a sense uh, uh, in a sense uh, also we also have to understand that how nation states are looking at that bio region they're looking at this bio region uh, as a very very strategic geography uh, in a very very securitized geography uh, and there there is where um, certain material sites of control has to come in and these material sites of control uh, have to come in in the form if not of border walls but in forms of ruptures in um, this sacred geography and with or it's also sacred to a lot of these communities who live in this region uh, uh, it is sacred to the tibetans it is sacred to the bhutanese it is sacred to the nepalese it is sacred to the host of minority communities who in, live in this inhabit this region and it is also the region where uh, at least 10 uh, major rivers of south and southeast asia uh, originate uh, these these are the himalayas the tibetan plateau uh, and the border walls that i am talking about in my paper uh, talks about dams uh, dams which are basically constructed either within a sovereign territory uh, but are increasingly looked upon now uh, as sovereignty markers uh, uh, because they can have that effect of bordering uh, uh, in this kind of a geography where there are no border walls per se, uh, but they can actually control the uh, the, uh, the livelihood of people living upstream of the river and downstream of the river. Uh, and this is a very, very upstream downstream connection which also happens in physical walls uh, around the world, uh, border walls around the world. Uh, and and this these sites of control um, are spectacular in nature. They are also uh, referred to by national leaders as temples of modern India, and also in China as uh, the mark of the great Chinese civilization. Uh, and these are also constructed in in territories which are very very you know uh, um, um, in a sense uh, very fragile ecologically. Uh, uh, so, in that sense, um, 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 this is very important uh, in a way to also have a very alternative framing, uh, uh, different alternative framings of how we also look at border walls as a concept. Very, uh, uh, if I may, yeah. uh, very briefly, yes. there's also two other walls that, that India is, uh, I, I think, working on, one with uh, mm -hmm. Pakistan and one with Bangladesh. So, the yeah. China-India border is not the only one. And the impact may be just as, as, as bad in those two border walls. Can you say in a minute or so something about those two walls? So, uh, in a sense, uh, we have different kinds of borders. For example, the India-Pakistan border is very, very well, uh, you know, uh, fenced. Uh, and there is a quite a lot of control uh, that operates in, in, in that in that part of the border. Uh, and in India-Bangladesh, it is a mix again. Have to the, towards the western side, it is quite well fenced, but towards the eastern side, it is not. Uh, and there is also a lot to do with these transboundary rivers that flow across this geography, because they are physically impossible to even construct a fence, to even think about that. Uh, and it also means very less to the communities who live along these borderlands, because uh, most of my research is on the east uh, towards Myanmar borders, uh, towards Bangladesh, towards China, where um, a lot of these uh, borders are unfenced. Uh, while Pakistan-India border is quite well researched and, and a lot of people have written on that. Uh, and it also captures the imagination of the international community. But there is so much more than only India-Pakistan uh, in, in the larger South Asian context. And that is where I try to bring in my paper in uh, in this special issue uh, of of looking at this larger ecological framing uh, uh, and and this community understanding of how um, dams work as border walls in this as sites of control as sites where you know uh, dams become tourism sites as national markers of sovereignty and and. and the, the community uh, worldviews um, get overridden by the state-centric sovereignty world.
uh, and we have a China uh, class, Galwan Valley, last year, um, where uh, rivers were actually used uh, to actually attack the other. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, both the armies of India and China are actually um, having a very, very different kind of a bordering effect and a different kind of infrastructural development effect in this larger bioregion, which is going to have a very, very big detrimental effect in the long-term health of the Himalayas. It'll be interesting uh, from your reflection, Mirza, to see how the nature itself interacts and sometimes undermines the wall. We know of sections of the wall in South Texas, between Tamaulipas in, in Texas, that when the river has actually uh, risen and, and the, the flow has become quite high and even violent, uh, some of the wall has actually fallen off. So it'll be interesting how nature at the end of the day will have a, a say because it, it eventually corrodes those structures, especially because they're, they seem to be constructed in the cheap in any event. Let me go to, uh, uh, Brigitte, uh, uh, uh Brigitte, I have a, 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 a question for you. Uh, in compare, in comparing the West Bank in, uh, in Colombia, uh, your, your case studies where you, where you examine this, interesting phenomenon. Would you uh, uh, lead us to the interaction between the physical uh, wall, the, the, the objective presence, the visible wall, and mental borders? I am uh, reminded in this question that uh, we human beings have a way of normalizing uh, uh, the landscape. And uh, what used to be abnormal becomes normal. And sometimes we don't even think about it. One, one time when I was in Cleve in the Netherlands, uh, in a coffee shop, interacting with a Dutch young man, just talking about border and, uh, and debordering and so on, uh, he literally told me, I never go to Germany, which was just on the other side of the, uh, of the border. And I said, why not? There's no, it's right there on the other side of the road. He said, I don't like Germans. I don't like Germany. I, I prefer not to go. So clearly there's a, there's a mental wall and he will not go to Germany. He's a, he's a Dutch uh, uh, young scholar and he, will, he doesn't like uh, Germans. That happens also with border walls. Can you tell us about a little bit about the psychology of border walls and the normalization of border walls from that perspective? Thank you. Right, actually I'm working on uh, invisible and uh, physical walls which may be internal and not only at the border or international borders and i'm looking at it um i mean the my research question or my major idea at the beginning was uh, uh looking at uh, symbolic violence in particularly and wondering how much symbolic violence can be a means as you said for normalizing walls whether they are physical or not or at the opposite, how much walls were, or whether, again, they were invisible or not, uh, was a way of normalizing violence, and particularly um, uh, symbolic violence. So uh, I've been, indeed, as you said, the normalization is probably one of the main impacts that I have seen in both cases, whether it's Colombia or, or the West Bank. West Bank, obviously, the system is there. It's very architectonic. It, it's very well planned. In the case of Colombia, the, the, I mean, I'm in a very different cases because I was much more looking how red zones and place where there have been quite a lot of physical violence has been stigmatized as almost walled area with invisible wall, obviously and how the communities within it were uh, fully stigmatized, but also normalizing the existence of those invisible walls. Uh, the, the case of, again, the West Bank is obvious. I mean, because the world is there. In Colombia, the system is very different because it's, as you said, much, much more emotional than anything else, much more psychological than anything else. Uh, but, I mean, it's quite clear if I take your, your German case of people disconnecting or not willing to go. But here, what is really much more interesting for me is how much the world communities or the world who are segregated or stigmatized have normalized and somehow accepting uh, the, the existence of, of those invisible worlds. And maybe even they are re-perpetrating them themselves. 
not, I mean, in the case of invisible war, the difference also, if it's not always planned by a government, it's not legalized like what we are talking about. It's much more this symbolic power that Damiano was, was talking before. So in the case of uh, Colombia, I've been looking a lot at the, um, the impact of, of this invisible wall on the communities and on the territories and how the population was responding to it. So the impact basically is through the fragmentation of, of space is to make all the issue extremely localized uh, to the point that there is also a fragmentation of leadership and an extremely difficult um, um, process for the population themselves to be able to explain, to voice, to make it out, to make the information out of what is really happening in the areas. But in the same time, this normalization that we were talking about is has to be seen almost as a positive and a negative uh, process. Positive in the sense that it would be almost unlivable if there were not a certain form of normalization. So normalization can be seen almost as a form of coping strategies, not a positive one, maybe a negative one, but the only way in the end of the day to be able in the everyday life to keep on going despite this exist existence of invisible wall. And obviously, uh, if the normalization is too strong, it will deter in the same time, the enhancements of resilience, but it will also uh, deter any form of activism or a lot of activism coming from the from the population themselves. So it was quite interesting actually to look at it and to see that uh, what we could see in the West Bank, which has been quite well documented in terms of symbolic violence of the situation was exactly the same somehow in Colombia where there is no not only no wall in within, I mean, architectonic wall, but also no uh, political uh, plan of creating fragmentation. This is much more, the fragmentation is much more coming as an impact of uh, the violence, the conflict, than strictly speaking, a plan which has been really well organized in order to segregate population or in order to uh, fragment the, the space. So despite that, the impact on both population is quite quite the same. Let me, let me uh, uh, push on that question a little bit more and give you another extra minute to think through it because you are a a uh, reader in humanitarianism. Are border walls inherently violent, uh, uh, dehumanizing? Do they have that kind of effect? And not only for the other, they are ultimately a process of othering, uh, but for the individual that supports and sees the wall from the side of the country that's building it? On the strictly dehumanizing uh, yes, definitely. I mean, this um, othering process is quite well known again, but I think that the only way of uh, accepting the existence of a world, and here I may talk more about physical borders or physical uh, wall than uh, invisible one, because it's somehow accepting or legitimizing the fact that they have been really created, means that the other side of the wall would be a real, almost an empty space, a, a no, a no-go zone, but also an empty space and a place where the population is almost, I mean, has been so much stigmatized that it is in, indeed quite dehuman, dehumanized. Uh, the stigmatization is quite interesting because the stigmatization is a way also of creating norms of what is normal and what is abnormal, as you said before. And it's quite interesting to see again that the wall is creating stigmatization of space and communities, but for both, I mean, for both communities, the one who are walled or the one who are walling, if I may say so. Yes, indeed. And this is somehow, I mean, it, 
it has never really been uh, challenged through humanitarian action. And, uh, but a bit more uh, through peace building actually. Uh, but it's still extremely, uh, I mean, I have never seen really a lot of action in terms of peace building directly in, uh, in the, I mean, on the ground, except for more like psychosocial support or uh, employability. But apart from that, there is not much that has been done by humanitarian actors uh, in order to try to, um, to de-wall, at least for the one who have been walled through conflict, to, to try to destigmatize or to de um, yeah to, to reintegrate somehow the population who has been segregated or fragmented uh, into the, the mainstream society. Thank you. It is quite interesting to think about what you're saying. And then uh, we haven't talked about this issue, but I think it's an important one. Uh, not just support for the wall, as it ended discussed, but also resistance to the wall. And it's interesting how often the resistance comes from uh, the humanities art, for example, and people begin to paint on the wall. It's a form of resistance, uh, perhaps a specific resistance, but it's interesting. And it does kind of counter the dehumanization with the humanization, because art, there's nothing more hu human than art, than the production of art. And so that is quite quite an interesting uh, uh, reflection that you offer, uh, Brigitte. Uh, let me uh, uh, go around very quickly in one minute so that we can then address the uh, questions that are coming in uh, and give you another opportunity to say something. What's, uh, when you think about border studies, our meta discipline, uh, the, the metier that we are in, you know, the, 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 the looking at walls and the studying of walls, what's missing? What do we need to pay attention to? Where should we take this, uh, this uh, research uh, next? Not just what you're doing, but the things that you are, as you look at them and study them, you say, oh, there's also this aspect and that aspect. And let me go backwards. Brigitte, you go first. One minute so that we have uh, 10, 15 minutes to address the questions coming in. Brigitte, please. Well, what, what I'm really missing the most is probably studies or more studies on, as you said, not only the resistance, but also the everyday resilience of the people when uh, they are living. I mean, really on the everyday life, uh, how those communities are living the wall, if I may say so. I mean, we know we have been, I mean, I've been talking about coping, and I think there is quite a lot of things which has been done on coping, and maybe a bit on adaptation, but um, there is also the transformative resilience, and I would like to, to have more studies or more ideas on how, through everyday practice, uh, communities can transform the environment and keep thriving, keep developing themselves despite the existence of war. And here it's true obviously for physical war, but definitely also for invisible war. Thank you, Brigitte. Mirza, where should, where is the next frontier for border studies, specifically in terms of walls, so to speak? Uh, there you are. Okay. It's from a very uh, old, yeah, uh, yeah. So I think uh, we also sense how we can understand. And as the theme of this webinar is is in very very plural context, uh, uh, interdisciplinarity that also has to come in not only from the arts but also engaging the you know, uh, engaging the what we call as an uh, outside the humanities as well, uh, and and that will be very uh, important because you know um, I think this uh, uh, plural perspectives uh, will inform how we look at the world from different uh, ways and how the uh, world means to the communities and how communities look at the world. Yeah, and that that will be very. Important. Thank you, Mirza. Kenneth. Um, I think we need to know more about supporters of walls. It's not something we really look at. We 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 sometimes assume it's a little bit extreme, uh, and, and I I would agree. 
Um, but we need to understand that dynamic more. As the Trump presidency has shown us, there are a lot of people out there uh, who either support walls or could be convinced to tolerate them as part of a broader agenda. Uh, and I think that needs more attention in border studies. Yeah, we often pay attention to the resistance, but we often don't pay attention to the dynamics of those who actually like them and support them and what's going on with them, right? Exactly. Thank you. Uh, let me go to uh, Damiano. Yes, let me try to answer your question with respect to legal scholarship, and legal theory in particular. Uh, as a matter of fact, legal scholars have paid little attention to the nature and functions of borders over the last few decades. And this is partially due to the narrative of globalization, uh, which continues to have a strong impact on legal literature, international law, for instance. Uh, it is, and in the age of globalization, the significance of state borders is declining along with uh, the concept of sovereignty. Uh, but current political reality shows quite the opposite, obviously. So the thing is that our traditional legal categories and concepts are not well equipped to account for the new reality of border walls. So in new categories and concepts, are needed along with new forms of regulation. And this will be a big challenge for legal scholarship in the near future. We need more imagination, I think. Thank you, Damiano. Irene? Well, um, maybe a, a current challenge regarding our field and specifically on, on wall borders is to recognize that one single physical border is not an homogeneous or uh, monolithic space. It, it means that uh, from a, an academic perspective, it is necessary to, to address all these variations in the dynamics, problems, consequences taking place in the same border. And um, it also uh, means that we need to uh, think about all these borderlands uh, that somehow are independent or not of the government uh, or of the or, or of those uh, bilateral issues and um, it's essential to recognize what factors make possible that border communities on both sides of the international limits are able to achieve a degree of autonomy in their interaction, in their relation to the border, in spite of all these problems, tensions, and uh, issues among neighbor states. So I think it's, it's in a call uh, to pursue a more micro scale approach if we want to gain a, a comprehensive understanding on the degree in which states are able or not to, to make borders functional to their interest and what is going on exactly uh, in each part of the world is sometimes not uh, the same uh, throughout the, the, the border. So I think it's a, another level of, of the study that it will be interesting. Thank you. And uh, Elizabeth? Um... Yeah, I, I like very much the idea of Damiano having more imagination. And I think definitely that's what we need. Um, on an empirical um, point of view, I think we need to really include climate change in the way it will accentuate everything we're studying here and everything we've been speaking about. I think there is it's the accelerator that we may need to imagine like maybe in advance like it, it, try to forecast what will be accentuated on a theoretical point of view i think one thing that is dearly um deeply needed and i think i'm i may be um well it, it's it's the, the 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 way we look at the border and irene you're, you're right we're, we're looking at, a, at the border as a monolithical uh space but the thing we're missing here is the point of view from the South. Like we see the borders and we qualify the borders. Our borders are very colonial and very white, even if we are having a critical uh, standpoint. But I do think that maybe we need to look at borders or hear the voices of the border. And all of you have been talking about that, to hear the voices of the border since seen from the Southern um, hemisphere of the globe and maybe there are a way to 
perceive the border through a nomadic lens, for instance? Is there a way to qualify the border in a different manner that will also would also, also change our, our own point of view and maybe bring us out of that semantical um, prison we are stuck in, which is very negative in a way, even, even if we are trying to to bring to 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 break those the walls of that semantical rhetorical um, uh, framework that we are in since 9/11, can do we really do that, or are we lacking imagination? And should we be thinking of other ways to conceptualize the border? Thank you, Elizabeth. I, um, as a political scientist, I think it might be also interesting to ask who builds and for what purpose. You know, what are the interesting political issues behind border building? It seems to me that there are political uh, interests at stake and not, and not just the organizational bureaucratic interests or the political theater interests, but there's other interests. Obviously people that are walled out uh, are specifically minorities, darker skinned, poorer, uh, displaced. And so there is a, there is a structure of uh, of, a, of hu the human condition that relates directly to who 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 walls, who builds walls, and for what purpose, and and who do they want to exclude? And that might be an interesting question. Let me uh, uh, relate a question. I'll direct it to somebody, and then if somebody else wants to jump in and say something, I'll direct this one to Kenneth uh, because I think it's a, a question that goes straight to some of the things that you're looking at. Um, Mexico and the United States have had a collaboration since the 1990s. In fact, back to 1944 really not just the 1990s, uh, over water management. Uh, and uh, the wall has continued to pace. There is almost 800 miles of walls now uh, out of uh, 2,000 miles. How, have, how has the wall, the walls, the sections of the wall affected collaboration between the two countries on uh, uh, perhaps on, on environmental and natural resource issues, but any other way, by natural cooperation? Kenneth. Um, there's a lot of ways you could look at that. Um, in, in some ways, um, uh, Mexico has cooperated with the United States. Uh, for example, extending border enforcement strategies uh, uh, to the southern border of Mexico, uh, intelligence sharing, and so forth. So in a lot of ways, the United States has co-opted, uh, encouraged, um, incentivize uh, Mexico to cooperate, cooperate in some of these respects. Um, it, it, collaboration, that doesn't mean it's not lopsided or one or one sided, though. So I, I think there still is that. Um, but there are other aspects, for example, uh, International Boundary and Water Commission, which is supposed to be a non political entity, ha has largely kind of sat on the bylines, si sidelines, uh, and, and not really uh, stepped up uh, to, uh, to minimize in environmental damage. Uh, and so we see um, uh, flooding happening in Nogales a few years ago because we didn't account for the fact uh, that building that wall was going to have a major impact when it didn't let water pass. Um, and not calling out construction in South Texas uh, that, uh, in, that infringed upon uh, flood zones and so forth. Um, so some, in some ways, I mean, they've just kind of, they're not as, as straightforward and as, um, uh, as, they, as perhaps they should have been, as, as perhaps that uh, boundary commission was intended to be. And that's, that's and been a suffering. That is an interesting, that is an interesting observation, uh, Kenneth. Uh, I, I know that uh, there are also building wall over these San Pedro River in Arizona, Sonora, and that is creating all kinds of issues. And uh, I think you are right in asking the question, what is the IBWC CELA uh, doing? Uh, I mean, there are the bureaucracy that are supposed to be pushing back, particularly because their interest is, is that, and what are they gonna do, especially as, the, um, as climate change proceeds uh, and uh, whether uh, events are going to get more more interesting and more violent. That's anybody wants to add to that, Elizabeth. You might have something to say on on the uh, binational collaboration. You've uh, been to our border. You've looked at it. Uh, how do you see uh, this wall being uh, affecting uh, the management of our natural resources and and environmental issues and cooperation? 
Well, I, I remember being with uh, with Kenneth along the border, and there was this uh, very low pedestrian um, fence. If you remember, Kenneth, uh, that uh, on the river, and uh, and since they've announced uh, since then they've announced the the the, the walling of that section uh, which uh, does not make sense so although there may be some cooperation on both sides the impact of the border wall and um we had also that discussion with uh, uh scott nichols who was saying that the new border fence in the rio grande valley could trigger some flooding and have some impact on both sides it, uh, hence um um, having an impact on one, uh, one side, flooding one side of the border and having maybe Mexico on one hand or the US on the other hand, having to deal with that uh, uh, issue on their own because the flooding would be on only on one side of the border. So it, um, I think there is uh, a, a great deal of cooperation on both sides. But once again, the border wall is kind of uh, walling out some of that potential for cooperation. Security seems to trump, <laughs> no pun intended, every other concern, including environmental no, concerns. Definitely. Yes. Anybody else wants to add something to, to this uh, conversation on, on um, binational cooperation and, wall, and walls, uh, how they're affected? Now, take it beyond the U.S.-Mexico border uh, in a minute or two. Um, anybody? Irene, what do you see? International cooperation binational cooperation frameworks and border walls. Well, I, I just want to add something uh, more local in terms of the Colombian context, because as you know, we have all these humanitarian crises uh, due to the uh, migration from Venezuela. And some voices argue that we need to build a wall uh, in the 2000 kilometers uh, with this uh, neighbor country. And it, it is just um, an impossible, uh, let's say, uh, commitment to 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 pursue from 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 the government, and uh, somehow, uh, just 15 days ago, the government is trying to create a new approach handling this migration crisis, saying we need to create uh, spaces of uh, recognition and regularization of these migrants and to uh, identify who need maybe international protection. And um, that is a, a side of the coin that I, I think is it's important. But at the same time, the, the lack of uh, bilateral uh, uh, cooperation and, and uh, the the lack of a, a diplomatic relation right now between Colombia and and Venezuela makes it very difficult to achieve some uh, in practical commitments in terms of reducing all these vulnerabilities that we are seeing in terms of the the migrants uh, and the. Uh, local communities uh, located in the borders. And I think that's uh, an, an important issue here. And it is because one of the discourses behind the use of walls is, of course, the, the problem of security. And uh, if we have just unilateral policies, we are not creating uh, maybe the best responses to, to this kind of phenomenon. Well, we uh, are, are promoting more from the an academic and, and uh, civil society perspective, the idea of creating shared, um, let's say, shared policies and cooperation uh, in the security level, in a cultural economic level, we are creating a, a, a way to address some of the complex issues that are taking place right now in the border. So the, the idea of giving just a militaristic approach to, to this issue is just um, creating a, a bigger problem and uh, a lot of revenues for these uh, transnational organized crime. That is, uh, of course, the the main, um, let's say, winner in, in this context of the securitization of migration and the use of border walls. Thank you, Irene. I want to direct the next question to our other panelists, Damiano, Brigitte, and Mirza, because I think it's an important question. Uh, we would be remiss, in fact, if we didn't talk about this issue. 
So here we are at a time in which the nation state is insecure, the insecure nation state, building walls, kind of walling itself in, protecting itself. And yet there comes the pandemic, COVID-19, the little coronavirus. And I says, well, thank you. I, I like your, your wall, looks very beautiful or not, whatever, but I'm tiny enough that I can go right through, right under, right over, right by plane, right by ship, right by. And so your wall is absolutely useless. So from the perspective of, of this little virus that has us all home, um, what, what is it that, how can, how can states truly protect themselves against these rather global issues like the coronavirus pandemic? Uh, are they are, are walls even useful to the kinds of challenges that we are going to face in the future? It would seem to me that there comes a virus that ultimately ridicules the very idea that we can wall ourselves and be protected. La, Damian. Yes, this is a very good point, actually. Um, and uh, I agree on, on, on the, the, the observation that you have just reported, actually. So the pandemic clearly shows that wars are useless uh, when new events occur. And, and, and there seems to be something related to the past and not being able to deal with the future, in a sense. Uh, I, I would add something to this in the sense that if, if we look how uh, European countries are reacting to the pandemic, we see that they are trying to reinforce the borders um, and to control the people moving from one state to the other side, uh, to another state. Even though there are some rules uh, uh, European countries that uh, are infringed upon by the government measure against COVID-19. So governments are trying to fight against the pandemic using borders, but this is, uh, 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 this effort seems to not be able to stop the pandemic as well, because we see that borders control, there are strict border control in Italy, for instance, right now. They are not effective. They are not suitable, uh, suitable means to, to, to fight against the, the crisis. So border seems useless when these kind of things occur. Thank you, Tamara. Brigitte? Yes, probably a bit the same as Damiano in the sense that indeed there is, I mean, issue we we talked now about the pandemic but we talked about climate change before where obviously it's on international collaboration that will allow to find solution if we say so but again the reaction of people is exactly the same as what we see usually they keep walling themselves as well i mean lockdown in the end is a creation again of invisible borders not against the pandemic but against others who may be uh, 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 contaminated and able to contaminate yourself. Um, in France, I mean, in the lockdown period, we had a range of one kilometers around the house where we were allowed to go out one hour per day. So we were definitely walled in. I mean, again, not with a physical wall, but definitely with an emotional or an invisible wall. So the reaction has been to wall people out or in as well. And again, as, as Damiano just said, in Europe, uh, the, the re-establishment of, of borders a bit everywhere is something quite, quite uh, I won't say frightening, but definitely not a, an understandable uh, response to, to the issue. Thank you, Brigitte. Uh, Mirza, you have the last word before I pass the mic on to Elizabeth to close. Mirza. Thank you. Uh, I actually, uh, just uh, before I had mentioned that the western side uh, of Bangladesh with India is uh, more fenced than the eastern side. And after the pandemic, actually, what has happened is that the government has uh, uh, prevailed upon communities who have traditionally resisted the fence on the eastern side and now to build more fences because the the process of othering has 
uh, become very complete in terms of using the coronavirus pandemic as an excuse to build more fences uh, and and uh, finalize that on the eastern side as well. So uh, my field work now in Meghalaya in Northeast India shows that there are more fences being built during the year that, that passed by uh, by the Indian government on the eastern side using the pandemic as an excuse to other the others saying that you know if we do not build a fence the virus will come in and attack you. So in that sense the resistance was basically quelled. And another um, example of this binational cooperation again between India and Bangladesh, uh, I wanted to uh, highlight the example of the hill surface, which is a very, very livelihood kind of a issue. The hill surface actually is uh, quite popular in Bangladesh and is a very popular Bengali dish. Uh, and But the hill surface actually swims upstream into Northeast India, into Assam, the river Brahmaputra, and comes and spawns within India. Uh, and, and the communities uh, ac across the border cooperate in terms of uh, not fishing, overfishing uh, during the spawning period. A and then they go back and, you know, so it it's a very excellent cooper binational cooperation ac along co communities, uh, local fisher, fisher communities uh, in India and Bangladesh. And, and therefore, these fishes can actually swim under any border wall and these rivers, basically, and do not do not care about the walls that are, and the fences that are build, being built on the land. So in that sense, transboundary spaces uh, quite uh, are nicely highlighted by this example. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for my part. Thank you all. Merci à tous et toutes. Et gracias a todos y todas. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you. you close. Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. Merci beaucoup, Tony. Thank you very much to you all. Our next uh, table round, the round table will be on climate change and border walls on March 17th. It will be in French, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on how you look at things. Um, so it will be in French and it will be at 12.30. Uh, my friends, thank you very much to you all. It's always a pleasure to spend some time with you. Tony, merci beaucoup. C'était un plaisir. Comme d'habitude, on est très chanceux d'avoir pu compter uh, sur toi aujourd'hui. Um, I wish you all a very good week and we'll see all of you on March 17th. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a good night.